So once more for those who are watching this on video, I have to apologize for wearing shades. Um, I've had surgery, eye surgery, and I have to go through um, several post-surgical adjustments before I can take off these shades. So try some stage um, having a shower and washing your hair and your beard while you're wearing shades. And you have some idea what my life has been like for the last uh, two weeks. Um, so let's stand for the gospel reading. So last week I read uh, Matthew's account of the temptation of Jesus in the desert and I focused on the temptation to power in the homily. Uh, this week I want to read Luke's version of the temptation and I want to focus on a different temptation, the, the temptation to food and sensuality and uh, addiction in some senses. So Luke chapter 4. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, because it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Words inspired by God. There are many words that uh, adults used to children who misbehaved in Ireland, in Gaelic. And some of them, there's no translation for them. You could be called, for instance, a dradera. And a dradera was not a very nice name to be, to, to be called as a child. But... Among them, the worst thing that a parent or a teacher or an adult could, could call you was a shifra. They said, you're a shifra. Now, a shifra is a changeling. It's a child that has been taken by the fairies and substituted with a fairy child. And it happened regularly in ancient Ireland. I don't know if it's happening still or not. I think it actually happens for every child when they hit the teenage years, you know, the child is taken away and somebody else is replaced for seven or eight years. But my grandfather, Daddy Jim, told me a story one time about a personal encounter he had, you know, with the Shifra. And it goes like this. In Ireland, when he was a child, and even when I was a child in the 1940s and 50s, when it came to harvest time, a bunch of farmers would get together and they'd cooperatively harvest in each other's land. So maybe 10 farmers would get together and they'd go to a Cardin's farm for three days and they'd harvest the crops. And then they'd go to Carmen's place and they'd harvest her crops. And then they'd go to Don's place and they'd harvest his crops. So they'd rotate, so they'd spend maybe three days with each farmer harvesting the crops together. And while the men were doing this back-breaking work, the women would get together and they'd cook for all the men. So that at lunchtime, there'd be a big feed of uh, hairy bacon and cabbage and potatoes and maybe a jug of buttermilk or maybe even beer. And this was, the, this was the system. So on one particular occasion, my grandfather lived in Blarney, just about a mile from the famous Blarney Castle. And he's a young man at the time, and he's helping out in one of these men, they're called Mehel, this group of men. And it came to lunchtime, and the woman of the house brought out the meal. And there was hairy bacon and cabbage and potatoes and buttermilk. And they began to dig into it. And all of a sudden, everybody is spitting out the bacon. They've never tasted anything as salty in their lives. And the, the man of the house is really, really embarrassed. 
and he goes into the kitchen and he starts giving out the yard to the woman. How the hell could you destroy the bacon like that? And she said, I, here, let me taste it. And she spat it out. She said, I can't, I can't imagine what happened. I've been cooking for 30 years and this has happen, never happened before. So she said, I'll be really, really careful tomorrow. I won't put any salt at all in it. So next day, they're harvesting again. It comes to lunchtime and she brings out hairy bacon and cabbage and potatoes and the buttermilk. And this time, it's saltier than the day before. It's absolutely pure. There's no way they can taste and eat this stuff. So they all spit it out. And at this stage, the, the man of the house is really, really upset. So there's an old, old man there. He wasn't helping with the harvest, but he was watching and smoking his pipe. And he went into the kitchen and he said to the woman of the house, tell me, ma'am, he says, by any chance, is there a little infant in the house? And she said, yes, I have a, a three-month-old son. And he said, I don't want to be nosy now, but can you tell me what his disposition is like? And she said, well, to tell you the truth, he's, he's real kreutzer. Kreutzer is like really, really cranky. And uh, he won't take the, the breast, you know, and he's very fussy and he's crying all out. I haven't got a wink of sleep in three months since he arrived. And so the old man figured out what it was. So he says, tomorrow when you're baking the cabbage, I'll hide myself in the kitchen and we'll see what happens. So next day, she's baking and she puts the cabbage uh, in and she puts the spuds in and puts the hairy bacon into a big pot. And that's up in the stove, a big steel, uh, cast iron stove uh, boiling. And then she leaves the kitchen. The old man is hiding behind the door. And I declare to God, as soon as the mother left the kitchen, the little child at three months old jumps out of the crib, runs across the room and gets a bag of salt and dumps it into the hairy bacon and then jumps back into the cradle. And the old man knew he had a, a shifra. He knew what a changeling. And he called all the men in from the field and all the women in into the kitchen and they're all standing around and he explains to them that he's caught the shifra in the act. Now the next part you may want to cl close your ears. It's really tough. Because the only way to get rid of a shifra is to burden them. So the old man grabs the child from the cradle and sits it right on top of the hot, red hot stove. And the kid is screaming, and the mother is screaming, and everybody is screaming. And all of a sudden, the shifra goes up in a puff of smoke, and there's a little whimpering cry, and they look around, and there's the original baby sitting in the cradle, beaming from ear to ear. And they all lived happily ever after. So that's the story of the shifra. And I'm going to use that story this morning because I want to talk about food and the temptations of food and addictions. And I'm going to make five main points quickly this morning. Uh, firstly, I'm going to make just a few introductory remarks about food. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about weaponizing food. And then thirdly, I'll call it, you know, coition and, con and conception. Fourthly, I'm going to talk about the notion of sacrifice. And then finally, the notion of fasting. And so a few introductory remarks about food. Uh, I want to kind of pick up where I left off last Sunday about the notion of being tempted in various ways. And so according to Hindu uh, philosophy and theology, as human beings go through all of their incarnations, and they believe that we go through thousands of incarnations, but there are four kinds of uh, gr groups of incarnations. And they say in Hinduism that the first group of incarnations, people are kind of addicted to sensuality. It's the first time they've been in human bodies, and so they're addicted to all kinds of sensual pleasures. And Hinduism says, and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. You know, absolutely nothing. As long as you can behave in a moral fashion, there's no problem about indulging, you know, what it means to have a physical body. Whether it's, you know, a good food or good sex or good wine or whatever, that's fine. As long as it's done, you know, with a moral code. But they say, after a while, you get fed up of just, you know, identifying with the body. And then the second temptation is the one I treated last Sunday. It's the temptation to power, privilege, and prestige. And you spend maybe a few hundred incarnations being addicted to these. And then the third level is you realize it's about service and compassion. But even that is an illusion because that's predicated on the fact that we're separated from each other. And so you have to be compassionate to the people who are less well off. And the final stage in Hinduism is called moksha, liberation where you no longer identify with the physical body. Even though you act through it, you don't identify with it. But the first one for them is the addiction to sensuality. And Buddhism picks up on this. There's a great story in Buddhism about the temptation of the Buddha, just like the temptation of Jesus. And he's tempted by maya, illusion. And maya says to him, 
if you really are an enlightened being, I want you to turn the Himalayas, the king of all the mountains, into gold. Demonstrate to me that you're actually an enlightened being. And the Buddha more or less said to her, if I turned all of the mountains of the world into gold, there wouldn't be enough gold to satisfy one, even one person's greed. So he refused to do it. And Jesus has been given the same temptation, you know, 560 years after the Buddha. He's told he's in the desert, he's been fasting for 40 days. And it's interesting, when you listen to Luke's account, you know, Matthew says he went into the desert, he fasted for 40 days, and then the devil tempted him. Luke first says he went into the desert and the devil tempted him for 40 days while he was fasting. So it wasn't just a temptation at the end of the 40 days, he was tempted right throughout the period. And at the end of Luke's account, there's a very significant passage. He says, the devil left him until a more opportune time. So the devil came back, probably in Gethsemane or on Golgotha. So in the meantime, he's been tempted to turn. He's really hungry and he's surrounded in the desert with just stones. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, turn this stone into bread and feed yourself. Now, in some senses, he's saying, you know, uh, God did that for, for your people, you know, a thousand years ago, when they were for 40 years in the desert, he fed them with manna, flour that kind of fall, fell down from heaven. So if you are the Son of God, just take one stone and turn that into bread, and then I'll be convinced. But what he was actually saying to Jesus is a much deeper temptation. It wasn't just take this one stone, turn it into bread, and have a nosh. He was saying to him, if you are the Son of God, turn all the stones in all the deserts into food, and then there'd be no more hunger for humanity. And Jesus realized immediately, you know, yeah, that's a temptation, but it's not a good temptation because as soon as you turn all the stones and all the deserts into, into food, the strong guys will capture it, they'll weaponize it, and they'll dish it out to those who obey them. So they'll weaponize the food, which is the second point I'm going to make right now. As I said last Sunday, there has never been a human discovery or a human invention that we haven't weaponized. We weaponized fire as soon as we discovered it. We weaponized food. We, not, we weaponized finance as soon as we you know, created it. We weaponized you know, boats when we made them. We weaponized aircraft when we made them. We weaponized even religion uh, when we made it. And so the food weaponization is a big one. And to understand that fully, I just want to repeat what I said last Sunday. The agricultural revolution, which happened in the Middle East about f a little over 5,000 years ago, where we developed the ox-drawn plow so we could mass produce food and ceramic pottery that would allow us to store it so the water didn't spoil it and rodents didn't eat it. And as soon as we did this, this is the beginning of monarchies and empires and dictatorships, strong men who took control of the food sources and used it as a weapon. And so you could weaponize it in three different ways. You could steal somebody else's food, raid their granaries and take it off. Or you could burn their supplies so they couldn't survive the winter. Or you could salt their land. Literally by putting salt in their land, it couldn't produce. And this, in fact, was a huge weapon. The Romans did it in Jerusalem in 70 AD, when after a four-year siege, they destroyed the temple and the city of Jerusalem. They salted all the area around it so the, the survivors couldn't grow food for two or three decades afterwards. So we weaponized food, and Jesus knew that. If he had turned all of the stones in all of the deserts into food, it would immediately have been weaponized by some kind of an oligarchy. And it still happens in our times. It happened in America, our own country, in the 1930s when we created this great American Dust Bowl, when agriculture became agribusiness, when we took over farming from people who had lived on the land, knew the land, and loved the land, and now it became a business instead. And this gave birth to the Monsantos of the world. People who tried to create a patent on life itself. People who took the results of 12,000 years of breeding. So you go way back before the agricultural revolution. You know, 7,000 years before that was the horticultural revolution, the digging stick, when people began to domesticate uh, grains for the first time ever. And for 12,000 years, we've been breeding these grains of various kinds. And now Monsanto wants to take patents on that and claim it's theirs, and nobody else has the right to use it. They have poisoned our land, our air, our water with insecticides and herbicides of various kinds. They've created what I would call eunuch seeds, seeds that cannot give birth themselves. 
If you know anything about farming, you know that a farmer typically divides the harvest into three pieces. The first one is to feed her own, her, his own family. The second one is to sell, to generate income so they can buy other stuff like clothes for the kids or whatever. And the third one is they keep grain so they can plant it next year for next year's crop. Well, Monsanto have created grain, unit grains, that you can't, you can't harvest it and use some of the seed from this year's crop to plant next year's crop. It's, it's a eunuch. It won't give birth. Tens of thousands of Indian farmers have uh, suicided because their government, in collaboration with these international Monsantos, don't allow them to use their own crops uh, for, for seeding. The, United, the European Union has a butter lake, butter mountains, literally hoarding butter into mountains of butter and lakes of milk, milk lakes. And they're paying farmers in Europe not to grow crops in order to artificially inflate the prices and drive the, 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 the profits up. So again and again and again, you find that food has been weaponized. So when Jesus resists this temptation, not to turn a particular rock into a piece of bread to satisfy his individual hunger, but rather to turn uh, rocks all over the world into food so everybody will have instant food, Jesus knew what, what it would, would lead to. It would just be weaponization of war. So that's my, that's my second point. The third point I'm going to call coition and conception. So I'm going to go way back even before the agricultural revolution, in fact, before the horticultural revolution, when human beings literally were hunter-gatherers. And so we just uh, consider ourselves very lucky if we happened upon a field of grain. We say, wow, amazing. And then we'd harvest it and eat it and move on until we found another field of grain or someplace where there were figs growing, you know, or someplace where there were grapes growing, whatever. And then the hunters were guys who, you know, who saw herds of wildebeest or elk or whatever, you know, and would, took off after them with stones or with the spears or eventually with bows and arrows, trying to get meat and get food for the family. So at that stage, we hadn't domesticated either animals or grains of any kind. So imagine the extraordinary aha experience it was when finally people discover that instead of wandering nonstop looking for grains, you could actually take some of this seed, instead of eating all of it, you could take it and plant it and just sit there and watch it. And in a few months' time, you'd have uh, another meal. Or they began to see that instead of hunting animals all over, you know, East Africa, you could learn to breed them and just keep them nearby and then use the calves, you know, for meat or the, the cows for milk or whatever. And at that stage, I believe, I'm trying to reconstruct this, as we came from our animal origins where coition and copulation was just an instinct to the realization that that's what actually creates the next generation. We hadn't made that jump initially. And now we make the realization that coition and conception are related to each other. And we discovered that first by watching the animals, you know, and not having to kill livestock, but to keep them uh, nearby. Now, this idea of cultivating crops and domesticating you know, animal husbandry was a huge move forward. But it was attended, I believe, by a very, very primitive mindset. So now that, you know, babies are being born, they, they believe, the system is, they believe that, you know, only God can create babies. The, 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 the statement was, only God can open the womb. So the first child that's conceived is conceived directly by God, and God has now opened the womb, and subsequently, any male can now impregnate a woman. But the first child always comes from God. And so when a child is born, it comes in, you know, very often crying and is covered in blood and is very painful for the mother. And so they believe that, you know, the first child particularly was stolen from God. And so you had to give him back. And the child is covered in blood and God is going to be really, really upset. He's not just going to punish the woman by making it difficult for her to give birth. He's going to punish the whole tribe for stealing what belongs to him. So you got to give back the firstborn. So you give back the firstborn of human beings, you give back the firstborn of the animal crop, and you give back the firstborn of the grains. And there were ways to try to get around that. So in Jewish tradition, for instance, if a child were really, really sick, the belief system was that God is trying to take the child back. He's going to kill the child to take it back. So they had a system where they would change the child's name, hoping to confuse God. So God is coming to bring back little Johnny, and now little Johnny isn't there. There's a little kid called Tommy. And you can't get like Tommy, you know, because Tommy wasn't the firstborn. So you can confuse God by changing his name. 
And even in modern times, and this is kind of funny, my good friend, Arlen Brownstein, who's had, you know, maybe 40 or 50 cats in her life. If ever one of our kitties is really, really sick, and typically she'll adopt kittens that nobody else will take. If a kitten is really sick and it looks like it's not going to make it, she'll change the kitten's name. And I declare to God, it always works. The kitten always survives. So the Jewish system has changed the name and confused God. In Africa, some of the peoples in East Africa had a belief system that if the firstborn were twins, then you were really in trouble. So not only had you stolen from God, you would stolen two of them from God in the same birth. And so what they would do is they would take one of the twins and they'd put it at a crossroads and take the other one back home, hoping that when God came looking for what belonged to him, he'd be satisfied by finding just one of them and he'd take it away with him and leave the second one. And in Ireland, as I said, the notion of the shifra, this notion that some kind of supernatural entities, fairies in this instance, could take a human child and substitute a lookalike or a shifra from it. So going way, way back, you have this great story in Genesis chapter 22, the story where God is asking Abraham to sacrifice his 12-year-old son Isaac, and he only has one son. And he's been asked to sacrifice it. And at the last moment, an angel stays his hand and he substitutes a ram. And now you have the notion that instead of giving back the firstborns of human beings, you could substitute an animal for it or plants for it. And this gives birth to the whole notion of the first fruits. You have to give back the first fruits to God of animals and of crops. And that's where the Passover ceremony comes from. And in many, many different uh, cultures, the ritual of during the lambing season, which is typically in the spring or Easter. So the great rituals you know, of slaughtering the lamb comes in the springtime because you're giving back to God a lamb instead of a human being. And this then will come into the New Testament that Jesus becomes the Lamb of God, that God is taking his own firstborn back, you know, instead of killing all the rest of us. And the same thing then, you had festivals of grain. So the festival of the, of the animals, typically animals would give birth in the springtime. So Easter, Passover, you know, rituals having to do with animals. And then later on in the year, during the autumn and fall, you have the harvest of the grains, and you've got harvest festivals. So that's my, my third point then. The huge shift between the realization, you know, that uh, coition leads to conception, that everybody belongs to God, particularly the firstborns, and they have to be given back or substituted with some other life form. The fourth point I want to make then, I'm just going to uh, sacrifice. So what do we think of when we think of sacrifice? And typically we imagine that sacrifice means that God demands blood of some kind. And the reason he demands blood is that we stole from him, we stole the firstborns from him. But when you look at God's behavior, particularly in the first five books of the Hebrew Scriptures, you know, uh, it's e easy to imagine that God demands blood. So, for instance, he throws our first parents, two pre-rational human beings, out of the garden for a single act of disobedience. He floods the entire world and kills everybody except eight people. He mandates genocide on a regular basis to uh, the Israelites as they go through the desert. And in the 613 precepts of Torah, there are many, many injunctions that, that say particular sins are deserving of the death penalty. And there were various ways of killing people. So it's very easy to think that sacrifice, that sacrifice somehow means killing or spilling blood. The truth is, when you just take the Latin word, the Latin word is sacrificere. You know, sacra ficere just literally means to make holy. Sacra, holy, ficere, to make. So sacrifice literally just means to make holy. So why would it be that you can only make something holy by killing it? You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's really, really primitive thinking. And so in the Ireland of my childhood and in the uh, Africa of my missionary career, you know, there were... There was a blessing that attended every part of the food production system. So when you were planting crops in Ireland, there was a blessing ceremony as you planted the crops. Whether it was planting spuds or planting wheat or barley, whatever it was, there was a blessing over the planting. There was a blessing over the harvesting. When these men met in the mehel, they prayed about what they were harvesting before they began the harvest. When women were preparing the food, they would pray over the cooking. And particularly, I watched my grandmother when she'd be baking bread and all of the women in the area 
where they were breaking, baking bread after they had kneaded the dough and shaped it. Before they put it into the oven, they'd take a knife and they'd cut a cross on it and then put it into the oven. And when the bread was baked and it came back out, there was this beautiful cross on the bread. So it was blessed even though it was being baked. And certainly it was being blessed as it was being eaten. There was a grace before and a grace after meals. So this is, you know, shifting the dynamic from sacrifice having to do with bloodletting to sacrifice having to do with gratitude. And so I want to just reprise what I said last Sunday about Eucharist, because Eucharist is both a kind of a koan or a metaphor for a good economic system or a good governmental model. It's also really, really good about food production. And so as I keep saying to you, that there was a code that Jesus used, four terms in order to signify that a Eucharistic encounter was taking place. Whenever you find the terms that he took, he blessed, he broke, and he distributed, you know that you're in the presence of a Eucharistic encounter. So what does it mean? I mean, he took, it means to accept graciously and with gratitude from God or from Pachamama, not to grab it or to, to have a patent on life or to zap it with insecticides of various kinds, but to accept it gratefully and graciously from God. Secondly, to bless it. And the blessing is not, you know, just performing a ritual and saying, you know, some secret words. That literally is just a symbol. It's realizing that everything is inherently sacred. Everything that comes from nature is inherently sacred. So the blessing is the recognition of that, not the imparting of benediction to a previously neutral substance. And thirdly, you have the, uh, the breaking. This is to form the intention of sharing the food with everybody, not just those at the table, but everybody throughout the world. And then finally, the distribution. It's about a walking the talk, not just having the intention of sharing food with everybody, but actually creating distribution models to make sure that the food, and there's plenty of it on planet Earth to feed everybody on planet Earth. It's only a question of the intentionality, you know, the economic models, the governmental systems, and the willingness to share with everybody who shares incarnation with us. It's my fourth point. And my fifth point, I want to just talk then about the notion of fasting. So we're told that Jesus went into the desert and he fasted for the 40 days. And we certainly have this, you know, during Lent, the idea of making Lent holy by some kind of fasting. And in Islam, there is Ramadan, and Buddhism has the notion of, you know, detachment. So what is this about? So in the West, in our times in the West, we oscillate between addictive behavior to foods. Obesity is, is probably the third most important killer in the Western world right now, obesity. So we're spending literally billions of dollars in overeating. And then we're spending other billions of dollars in trying to heal ourselves from the problems created by overindulgence or by addictions in various ways. Meanwhile, there are literally millions of people elsewhere in the world who are starving for food. So you got this oscillation between overindulgence and you know addictions of various kinds in one place and starvation in the other place. So what is fasting about then? Fasting is about the temporary and voluntary experience of hunger so that we can have solidarity with those who are chronically you know, and involuntarily having to deal this, with this throughout their lives so that we can be compassion in action, so that we can form the intentions and create the distribution modalities and the governmental systems and the economic models that make sure that everybody on planet Earth has food. And that in, that's the way in which we will turn all of the stones of all of the deserts in the world into food for all of the peoples of the world. So feeding the world is not about a miracle. It's about the individual, the community, and the global realization that we have a shared incarnation with all the creatures of the planet. And in that sense, you know, we have to create models, economic models and governmental models that make that a reality for everybody. We just finished with a quotation. There was a, a very famous Archbishop Re Recife in uh, Brazil uh, called Dom Helder Camara, regarded even when he was alive as a saint. And at one stage, you know, Dom Helder Camara was really, you know, upset about the unequal distribution of the world's resources. And at one stage, he made this statement, having been criticized. He said, "When I give 
food to the poor. They call me a saint. When I ask, why is it that the poor don't have food? They call me a communist. 